Hey everyone, welcome to a brand new Take Aim Outdoor Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Brandon Hammonds, and excited to have Michael Hunsucker on from Heartland Bowhunter. Michael and Sean have hosted the show for about 12 years now. It's one of the longest running shows, probably on the Outdoor Channel, and still to this day, one of my favorite shows, and one of the only select few few shows that I still watch. Uh, They just put out endless amounts of great content and always been a fan of those guys. And one of the reasons I'm a big fan of them is they hunt a lot of their own own properties. They do all their own prep work. And Michael shares with us uh, this time, some of the prep work they're doing at this time of the year, I should say. And uh, it's a great episode. You don't want to miss. Hope you guys enjoy. All right, guys, we're live, brand new Take Aim podcast, excited to get a new show out, and with me today from Heartland Bowhunter is Michael Hunsucker. How are you doing, Michael? Hey, how's it going, man? I'm, Good, man. Uh, doing well. Good. Glad uh, you could join us today. I know you're busy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm happy to. A lot, lot going on, but uh, it's a good time of year. Yeah, for sure. It's a awesome time of year, but um, I know that... Uh, I, I've been following you guys forever, Michael, but just if you want real quick touch on uh, Heartland Bow Hunter, and I, I know it's probably by now one of the longest running shows on uh, Outdoor Channel. Yeah, yeah, man, we've uh, been doing it for a long time. It's kind of hard to believe our uh, new season that will be premiering uh, coming up here in, in July is uh, our 12th year, 12th season. So um, we've been, you know, we're, we're starting to film now for our 13th year, so been doing it a long, long time, and ever since, you know, we, Sean and I were in college when we first got started, and, um, you know, we, I, well, we actually got started filming before that, even just in high school for fun and stuff, so um, it's crazy. It's come a long ways, and the, the industry's changed a lot over the years, but it's a really cool industry to be a part of, and, uh, you know, I couldn't, wouldn't change anything to the world. We love what we do. No, exactly. I know that, uh, I mean, I've just heard some of the background from you guys, and I know that, uh, I mean, you guys got actually in the industry doing camera arms, and then it turned into the TV show, which is remarkable. And like you just said, here you are 12 years later with uh, still, in my opinion, the best, uh, one of my favorite, if not the best, bow hunting show out. And uh, I I always appreciate what you guys do, and uh, I'm always looking for more and more content from you guys and just, you know, honestly have always enjoyed it. And and watch you guys kind of grow and progress with the show, and I think you guys have just always done a remarkable job. Well, awesome, yeah. Thank you very much. We we, we appreciate it. Uh, we, you know, that's one of the main things we do, or why we do what we do, is just because of uh, you know all the all the positive feedback that we get and, and the um, the stories that we hear of people that that maybe weren't hunters before that got turned on to hunting because of our show. Um, that type of stuff is is just fuel to our fire. Yeah, for sure. I know we're going to talk in a moment about some off-season kind of prep work and what you guys do, but um, I just wanted to ask you real quick. I know that uh, you have posted on your Instagram, uh, I don't know when it was, a little bit ago, but a, about your grizzly hunt that was two years ago, and I know that obviously we're going to talk about deer today, but I just wanted to kind of touch on that for one second uh, just because I think even as much as you love deer and I love deer, and that's why we're talking today, it's... It, uh, always in the back of my mind what one of those hunts is like because we're deer hunters and love big deer but we also have that itch as a bow hunter to go do these yeah, adventure hunts and uh how was that for you how'd you enjoy the whole experience yeah absolutely that's um it was an incredible experience and awesome awesome hunt and um you touched on it perfectly i mean you know i learned cut my teeth you know in the midwest whitetail hunting and uh if i had to choose one thing to hunt the rest of my life, it'd probably be whitetails, but uh, when it comes to just exploring new areas, new places, doing hunts that you haven't experienced before, uh, there's a lot, a lot of excitement, a lot to be said for that, and so uh, with the brown bear hunt, it, it was kind of one that was always kind of a bucket list hunt for me, because the the guy who we hunted with actually was a high school friend of mine, um, and so we went, went to high school together, grew up together, he moved up to Kodiak after high school, and started guiding, and so naturally we'd kept in touch, and and uh, he had shared, you know, photos and stories and all the successes that he's had up there, you know, guiding brown bear hunts, and and he had done quite a few with a bow, and 
and, and being the, that's primarily what, what we do, it was kind of a natural fit and uh, the opportunity kind of came up and it was actually, you know, we kind of talked about it and we're thinking, you know, down the road more, but um, he had a, he had a, somebody back out of a hunt that couldn't, couldn't come. And so it ended up bumping mine up and uh, it was uh, definitely a trip of a lifetime. It's definitely just a completely different hunt and experience and uh, a lot different than whitetail for sure. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it's, um, I don't know. I mean, a hundred percent different, obviously, but I, I would assume you guys just spent so much time just kind of behind glass and trying to figure out which ones are big, big male boar bears and, and, uh, doing it over and over and probably a couple failed spot and stalks. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's much more of a patient, it's a slow hunt, you know, more of a patience game and, um, whitetail hunting, you know, it's, it's pretty slow also, you know, it's, it's, it's a game of patience as well, but, um, you know, with whitetail hunting, you're going to sit, you know, four or five hours at a time or maybe even all day here and there. But, like, with this one, we're out there, you know, and we're hunting all day long, every day until we get a bear. And it took me 12 days to get mine. So you can imagine wow. uh, a lot of time a lot of time in the field. Yeah, that is for sure. I know that since you're as successful, if, I, if my memory recall, recalls right, now do you have to – isn't there a time period you have to wait now if you want to reapply? Yeah, um if you're successful, I believe you have to wait three or four years. I can't okay, remember so. exactly, but yeah, if you're successful, you have to wait three or four years. If you're unsuccessful, I think you can hunt. You can hunt the following year, I believe. Oh, okay. Well, you're. So, so you're I, I may be. I may not be reply right then, almost <laughs> within a year or two. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, it's definitely something I'll do again um, for sure at some point. But it's something that kind of one of those deals where you experience. Uh, you know, it's just a, it's just a crazy, crazy experience. So, uh, it's something that you're not going to do every year. It's kind yeah. of a, you know, out of the box hunt, but, uh, it's definitely worth, worthwhile and cold that my buddy that we did the hunt with, he's just awesome to hunt with when it comes to archery. He actually last year, um, guided the number one brown bear world record with a bow. So, Holy cow, uh, did they you really? just, they just confirmed that. Yeah. They just confirmed that. So yeah, the thing that's kind of cool about Cole and unique about Cole is he does, you know, he, he kind of specializes in the archery hunts. Of course, he does gun hunts too. But, you know, when it comes down to it, if you're guiding a hunt, the tag of any weapon, you know, and you're an outfitter or a guide, you're wanting to get guys in there, you know, have them kill their bear on the, you know, third or fourth day and be done and not spend, you know, 12, 15 days trying to get one with a bow. And so it's a lot, lot more challenging with a bow. And so a lot of guys, I think, kind of steer clear of it. I've actually had friends of mine just um, who, you know, are talking about wanting to do a, brown bear hunt and, and talking to folks about the about the hunt and, and they always say like oh yeah like you know bring both but they always try to push them towards the gun side of things it seems like and so i always tell people if you really want to do it with a bow make sure you stick to your stick to your guts and your guide's always going to have a gun if you uh, get down to the wire and you want and you want to use it last minute but uh, right yeah it's now, deal. it's just tough was, was that cole kramer yep you were with? yeah okay well that's pretty cool i know uh for those that don't know, Cole, Cole's got a pretty cool Instagram page where he shares a lot of that stuff. And, uh, yeah, he's a heck of an outfitter, it seems like. So that that was probably a neat experience and pretty cool that you already knew him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, you know, we, we both kind of gravitated towards the hunting industry after high school. And um, just we were in early in our careers and just grinding and didn't have a lot of time, you know, spare time to kind of hunt together. And we talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. And, um, Sean and I actually went up there and hunted with him, uh, five or six years ago, um, and did a blacktail hunt with him. And it was after his season was over. Um, so he was like kind of exploring, checking out a new area and we were kind of just hang, hang you know, tagging along with him and kind of a, it was kind of one of those deals where we both had some downtime. We made it, made it work. And, um, so we hadn't hunted together much, you know, prior to then since he moved, moved up there. And then we did that hunt and then did the bear hunt. And then Sean and I actually both drew mountain goat tags for Kodiak for this, uh, this fall so we'll be back there in september oh how cool now the blacktail hunts you guys do that on like kodiak island or was that on setka or no the blacktail was on on kodiak too yep oh how cool now yeah uh as a deer hunter how did you rate that hunt did you really enjoy it because i mean when i've seen video and stuff like that it looks like it's the kind of the perfect combination of a you know an adventure hunt but you're getting to spot and stalk and it's deer to me which is always awesome yeah, no, it was cool. Uh, it was it was a really tough hunt for us. Like I said, we went in December, so the weather was just terrible. Days were Freezing, short and cold, and 
um, we were exploring a new area uh, that Cole hadn't spent much time in, and it wasn't that great of an area. So, um, you know, the hunt from a from a quality standpoint, you know, it wasn't wasn't the best hunt in, in the world, but we had a blast. It was a, like like I said, it was a new experience, and um, I actually hadn't uh, I didn't I, we got to the point where I was like, okay, like this we knew this was not going to happen with a bow. There just wasn't that many deer, and the, the, there was just a lot of alders and just tough stocking conditions. And, uh, and it was the last day, and the, the plane was coming to get us. And uh, Cole got up and spotted the buck behind camp. He's like, hey, man, if you want to go try to shoot this buck with my gun, you can. And so that's what I did, actually. That was the first buck I had killed uh, with a gun, and I don't even know how long. So uh, it was it was a cool experience. But Cole's got some other areas that he guides on primarily that are just dynamite for, for archery hunting. So um, actually, I believe we'll have a uh, – well, I believe we'll have a deer tag – um, to go along with our goat tag this year, so uh, that's if, we, cool. if we do happen upon some blacktail, we may may go after them. Yeah, absolutely. When's your tag get good for the mountain goat at mountain goat time wise? Um, it's I'm not sure when the season starts. Sometime in August, and it goes through September. I think we're going the first week of September. So oh, um, that's, that's cool. another hunt that we've never done before. And honestly, I've you know I've never had a ton of interest in in hunting, you know, sheep, mountain goat, that type of stuff. But, um, you know, I've just heard stories from Cole and how much fun it is. And like I said, it gets back to just trying something new and experience something different. And so I'm all for that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, in my opinion, the mountain goat is probably, in in the grand scheme of things, kind of very underrated in uh, big game. You know, it, it's up there for me. I think that it just gets uh, – overlooked everybody wants to just bighorn sheep hunt or something else hunt i just uh i think it's really a unique animal it's unique to north america and uh i don't know just kind of underrated to me i think it's super cool animal so i wish you guys luck and uh weather wise hopefully it's a lot better for you that time of year yeah it definitely should be it's, it's kodiak so it's always wet and rainy can be anyways so um uh, but uh the temperature wise should be a little more a little more reasonable <laughs> yeah for sure well but anyways, I just wanted to touch on that, but I'm excited to kind of get with you and talk some deer stuff, and uh, I know you're probably sitting at home or in the office in Missouri, I take it? Yep, yep. So uh, what are yep. you uh, guys kind of doing in this off season that we're in right now? What do you guys kind of focus on this time of year, and what is maybe just your niche, Michael, that you like to do kind of the most this time of year as far as maybe improving habitat or feed or whatever, or trail cameras, whatever it is? Yeah, that's absolutely that's one of my favorite things about about whitetail hunting is kind of you know you get out what you what you put in and um, over the years we've definitely got more and more serious on the management side of things on the habitat improvement side of things um, and so it seems like you know there's never really an off season for you know for us obviously uh, turkeys close now and deer doesn't open for a few more months but um, there's so much that goes on in these these months in between the two the two seasons that. Um, that, that we do to help just kind of benefit our hunting in the fall. And um, not to mention it's, you know, for us from a, from a business side of things, it's a busy time of year for us from a production side. So we're, you know, cranking out a lot of the episodes, putting them together as we speak now for uh, the ones that are going to be released uh, coming up here in July. So, um, but yeah, I mean, just uh, actually yesterday um, I uh, went and I had to, I was mowing some of my clover plots, kind of maintaining those and, you know, getting those those ready. I had I had one that was a previously established clover plot, so really good shape. Um, just needs mowed for you know for maintenance and longevity, and and so I came in and kind of mowed it. You know, kind of topped it, mowed it high, um, just to knock down some of the grasses and the weeds. There's a few, you know, a little bit of weed competition, and uh, got that knocked back. And then I had a new plot that I established this uh, this this spring. I uh, early this spring I frost seeded, and clover is one of my favorite things. You know, when it comes to planting a food plot and getting a food plot established, it's probably one of the easiest and um, best ways for somebody who even maybe doesn't have a lot of equipment to get a plot, a plot established. Um, there, this particular plot, I just went in and frost seeded this this spring. Um, it had a lot of exposed dirt, but uh, pre- previously had not been planted in anything. So, went in and frost seeded it, and uh, and you know came back this spring, took a look at it, and it actually. Uh, germinated really well, but as a lot of times there are with the the first year clover plot that had a little, quite a bit of weed competition. So I came in and mowed that one pretty low. I didn't didn't scalp it, but mowed it down pretty low to where it knocked back the weeds. And we actually had a rain coming um, yesterday evening, and then another chance tonight. So 
Um, it's always good to mow those back right before a good rain, and a lot of times that clover will just blossom and just take off, and it'll outcompete a lot of the weeds. And so I'm hoping that's going to be the case with this new one. Um, and uh, but I'll, I'll go back in a couple, you know, another week or so, and uh, check it out, see how it's doing. And um, the, the nice thing about clover is there's, there's ways you can come in and spray it too to kill the weed competition. So um, it, it's one of those food plots that just, you know. It's easy to establish, pretty easy to maintain with just, you know, typical mowing, occasional maybe having to spray it um, occasionally, and, and the deer just absolutely smash it. They love it. So it's one of my one of my favorite plots to plant. Yeah, it seems to be that uh, clover has a lot, a lot of benefits just based on what Michael was just saying. I mean, you can frost seed it, which anybody can do, and, uh, you know, afterwards, you know, you check on it, you do what Michael said, you go in and... and uh, you know, maybe try to spray some of the weeds, you know, to kill the competition. But how often, Michael, do you go in and check on a plot like that before you're, let's say, ready to respray or kind of make a decision on what's next on management-wise for that plot? I usually give it, a, you know, a couple of weeks usually to let it rebound and, and see. And, um, you know, depending on what the weed competition looks like, um, I, uh, there, you know, there's always uh, – you know, different types types of weeds, and so certain certain types will be more prevalent in the spring, and certain types maybe more in the fall, and um, certain types that you know really prosper during during hot and dry months. So, um, you know, I like to keep an eye on it and, and see. And there's a couple different, uh, you know, you could spray you could spray products that kill that eliminate grasses specifically, and then you can spray other products that eliminate broadleaves. And so it's pretty amazing that where you can, you know, you have all of these options to, to kill and eliminate these weed competitions without actually damaging the clover plot itself. So, Yeah, it is amazing. How often, uh, once you got it kind of what I would call weeded out, Michael, how, how often do you go in just to trim it to keep it healthy, like off-season-wise? If, if uh, I know you guys get to kind of manage that stuff really strict, but, I mean, in ideal wor- world, uh, exactly how you want to do it, how often do you do it? I'd say probably once a month or so. Um, you know, usually in the spring, the clover will kind of head out and seed out, and it's kind of good, I think, to come in and mow it then because it just, you know, broadcasts some of that seed and kind of helps re-germinate, uh, re-germinate some of the, the some of the plants. But uh, I'd say once a month is probably, you know, the typical how how often we mow ours. So um, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't require a lot of maintenance. And, and the nice thing is a lot of people, you know, you could do it with your lawn tractor if you need to, you know, just raise the deck all the way up and, and uh, run it over. So, yeah. Um, for actually, sure. sometimes sometimes I prefer, you know, some of the plots to get a good, you know, nice, good even mowing. It's nice to have a, um, you know, you can do it with a zero turn or a riding lawnmower pretty pretty easily. Yeah, that that's a great idea actually, and it's a lot easier to get in than a big old tractor, obviously. Which, uh, um, that's a really smart idea, which is pretty nice. When you guys kind of go to set up a property, Michael or look at a property this time of year, let's say it's a new one or one that you guys kind of want to transition, what do you look at first? Is it just kind of based on where you want to put food or um, or is it like maybe doing a select cut of timber to get in a plot or what do you guys look for first um, during this time of year? You know, it depends on the property. Um, you know, a lot of times um, you know, it depends on what food's available, where the cover is. There's a lot of variables that go into it. Um, but, uh, you know, what I like to do is look and see what food is available. And, uh, you know, what, what based on what food is available, kind of make a decision on what, what kind of food you want to maybe add to that. And um, so, you know, like I said, the clover may be a good option, maybe a good uh, option to plant some, some brassicas or some turnips. Um, a lot of times we plant a lot of corn and soybeans too. So there's, you know, it's good to have greens, good to have grains. It's really nice just to have a variety is the main, is the main key. I mean, deer prefer a different food source, um, you know, all throughout the year, different, depending on, you know, what time of year it is, they may prefer something different. So the clover may be really attractive in the September, October months, but you get into, you know, November, December, they're going to prefer, you know, cold, you know, cold weather, they're going to prefer the grains and, and other types of food sources. So it's just, it really is a per property basis. Um, but it's one of the things is you can never have enough variety um, to where, you know, give the deer options. I feel like that's always the best bet. Yeah, for sure. Now, like historically speaking, Michael, I'm sure you guys have had properties you've had for, let's say, several years, let's say five to ten plus years, and you probably have new ones that kind of come and go every year. 
on some of those ones that you've had historically that are older, do you guys kind of go mad scientist on a program for the first so many years until you get it down pat? And then do you get to the point where you're like, this is it, this is how we're going to maintain it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We definitely get it to where, you know, a lot of times we'll improve it to where the best we can and uh, kind of, you know, change things and figure out what the best formula is and what works the best for us. And then uh, once we kind of have that dialed in, um, you know, we kind of just tweak as we need to. And a lot of times, um, you know, it doesn't really matter much from year to year, but sometimes it does depending on, um, you know, what kind of uh, weather we get in the year. If we have a drought year and you know, like last year, man, our corn really didn't do very well. We had a really, really dry summer, and so it didn't put on a lot of, a lot of years. And so our corn, our corn plots were just really, really minuscule. And same with the beans. You know, the grains just didn't do that great. And so um, we definitely had a lot more focus on the other types of plots, the, the green food plots, to where uh, the clovers, the brassicas, that type of stuff. So a lot of it does depend year to year. Yeah, for sure. I know it's hard to tell every year. You know, I, I always kind of like to look at a property like, you know, what has worked, what hasn't, so to speak, just like you guys. And what you said just is uh, so key is is you really don't know until like August hits because, man, it can change on a dime if you get a drought or don't get a drought. And uh, it's, it's crazy. Last couple of summers, it's been really hard to kind of make a plan and stick to it because August has really dried up a lot of those plots or a lot of the work you put in. And then you start to get nervous and you got to go make changes. And uh, when you guys have to make last-minute changes like that, is there a go-to that you guys kind of do, uh, you know, like a clover or, you know, or maybe you just go right to turnips? Um, yeah, like in the fall, we do a lot of – we plant a lot of turnips in the fall, a lot of uh, a lot of brassica mixtures. Um, and uh, last – I was trying to think, two years ago, um, we planted our fall plots like we normally do in, in late August, early September. And uh, – and we had an extremely, I think it was like late August, and we had a really dry, you know, dry year, and we did not get any germination hardly at all. So we actually came in and replanted some of those um, in, in like the second week of September, which is later than normal, um, later than you'd like to, but we wanted to do that just to make sure that we had some food. And um, it, it just, uh, you know, it, it never fails. It's always one way or the other. Right now we're dealing with extremely wet conditions. So um, we did get our corn in, fortunately, uh, for the most part, but a lot of it, some of it did get a little too wet, and so we're having to replant some areas, and uh, we still haven't even been able to plant our beans yet either. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's always something. It seems like, you know, it's too dry, it's too wet, it's just hard, it's hard to get that perfect weather combination. So we just kind of do the best we can and, and, and try to time our plantings as as, uh, as best we can and just kind of go from there. So um, you can only deal with, you know, so much that Mother Nature Mother Nature deals deals us, so we can only do so much with the cards we're dealt. <laughs> no, that's true. You never know what she's going to pull on us. And uh, I'm in Michigan, and up here it's been the same way, Michael. It is uh, – we have to be approaching probably record number of, of rain uh, for this part of the year so far. It's been so wet that uh, legitly anything you've planted, it's, it's been washed out. So there's definitely going to be some changes made as far as that go. And – uh, even stuff like, you know, a mineral or supplemental feed, it, it before you know it, it's washed out in the earth and, and gone again. So right now it just seems to be like you have to be kind of uh, on your toes and, and just running around doing a lot of upkeep, so to speak. Um, I don't know yeah, about you guys, yeah, yeah. but it's just been, it's been extremely wet. I, I know you said you just got some rain, but it's been insanely wet here. I mean, just, uh, I think... The week before last, in 48 hours, we had like five and a half inches, which is just crazy. Yep, yep, same way for us, same way. Uh, just been been brutal. So uh, the the clover and the grass and all that stuff is, do, is doing good, but yeah, it's just been hard to be. You just can't get in the field when it's that wet. It doesn't. We haven't had enough time to dry out. So no, for sure, for sure. Now, when you guys get really serious, Michael, about uh, starting to run your cameras and, and all that good stuff. And do you guys have uh, kind of science behind how you guys run your trail cameras for the summer? Yeah, so I actually, uh, we just got done um, over the past couple of weeks too, kind of freshening up our, our mineral sites and putting out trophy rock and 
Um, we do, we will put out a handful of cameras now um, in areas where, you know, maybe, you know, particular deer it maybe lives that we want to make sure, you know, made it through. We know he, we know he made it through, through up to shed season, but, um, but we'll start running a few cameras now. And then usually I would say around the middle of July, we get a little heavier into the, heavier into it. And, um, and then we, uh, you know, start running more cameras for kind of inventory purposes and trying to figure out, you know, what deer made it and what deer are kind of using certain areas that we might be able to key on early season because uh, in Missouri we have a September 15th opener, um, which is really nice for, uh, you know, just to be able to capitalize on some of those summer patterns. Some states even have, you know, even earlier seasons up to, you know, September 1st, a lot of them in Nebraska and uh, North Dakota's got an early opener. Kentucky's got an early opener. So there's a lot of different, uh, there's a lot of different states out there that allow early archery hunting and it's one of my favorite, actually, it is my favorite time to target a specific mature deer just because um, they're patternable. They're not running around chasing a doe and rutting all over the place. So, uh, so yeah, so we, we start putting in minerals and, and uh, monitoring that stuff right now and all the way throughout the summer to try to make a game plan together for uh, early season. Now, uh, for you in Missouri, Michael, I know it opened September 15th, but, uh, how do you guys approach that beginning of the season um, at sep- September 15th time-wise? Are you looking for, you know, preseason scouting-wise, are you guys pretty much doing just cameras? Or are you also glassing fields? And when it when it hits that opening day or the day after where the season's still fresh and it's real low pressure, are you guys mostly just hunting kind of like evening spots over food, or how do you guys adjust to that? Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, you know, we definitely utilize scouting to our advantage too and glassing from vantage points. Um, there's just certain areas that, that, you know, kind of allow that and there's others that don't necessarily. So, um, the, the main thing in Missouri, it seems like for the Midwest really in general is, is the soybeans. The deer are really just keyed on the soybeans that time of year, um, for the most part. And so, you know, if you can get a vantage point to where you can overlook a bean field with spotting scope and not get in, too tight to where you're causing, you know, damage to serving deer. Um, that's going to be the ideal situation. And so uh, we, we do do a lot of that, you know, especially leading up into, into the season to kind of get a better idea because trail cameras, number one, you know, they only capture so much. Um, you know, you like to think that, um, you know, we're, we run reconnaissance trail cameras and, you know, they don't, they don't miss much at all. They, they're, they're some of the most reliable cameras out there, but it's, at the same time, you know, you go hunt in an area where you have a trail camera and you watch deer walk behind the camera around the side or, you know, you see a couple hundred yards away, you see a deer. And so they can only really, you know, tell you so much. And so um, we do use a lot of time-lapse mode on, on trail cameras so you can see kind of in the background because a lot of times if a, if a buck has his head up, head up, you can see a specific, you know, you can kind of see characteristics of that deer and kind of get an idea of who he is. But, um, you know, it, it's hard to beat the actual, you know, being there in the field. And so early, you know, late summer, early, you know, prior to the season opening up, if you can get out there and scout and, and get an idea of where a deer's coming from, where he's bedding, you know, where, what particular areas of the field they prefer to feed in, all that information is helpful when it comes time to kind of putting a game plan together. Yeah, for sure. I want to just slightly backtrack a little bit and ask you about, like, uh, I know you mentioned you guys plant some corn and beans, but we've started to kind of plant some late season beans but it's tricky here in Michigan because we're a little farther north than you guys and it gets cold sometimes real quick but do you guys plant some of your bean food plots kind of later in the year to have like a little extra green we have we, yeah we have done that in the past we, we plant some later in the year um, so they stay greener longer we've also used different blends um, you know like a forage blend uh, a soybean that, that actually is more focused on um, you know leaf and tonnage production and less on the pods and um, they stay green you know all the way throughout through into October because like you said um, if you get your beans in early right around September 15th a lot of them are already tur- already turning and dropping leaves so uh, that's always been been key and so uh, but for us like I said we, we like to have variety and have the you know you have the clover as an option if the beans do dry out and uh, you know you just kind of uh, see how see how the year goes and then and then monitor your cameras and kind of see what the deer are doing and see what they're preferring and uh, kind of make your plan based off that that information yeah for sure another thing to kind of go with that michael i didn't really ask but do you guys do kind of um structured food plots with uh like green 
green to green transfer or green to grain? Do you guys kind of layer different plots within one big section? Uh, yeah, we definitely do some of that um, where, where it allows full well, food plot architecture, so to speak. Um, yeah, uh, so we, we do have a we have a existing lucky four-leaf clover plot that kind of we came in those some timber right off the edge of the big ag field. And that on that on that edge of the big ag field is where we'll leave a lot of our standing grain. And so we'll have both, you know, the clover there and the grain there. And then we can, you know, kind of choose where we're going to hunt depending on the weather, tip, you know, the weather situations and what exactly is going on. And so um, a lot of that, you know, it sets up as a great staging plot as well. So, you know, it's kind of secluded and it's kind of surrounded by timber. So deer are more comfortable kind of coming out there, um, you know, in, in the daylight hours before they venture out into the main more destination food sources. So there's definitely different types of food plots. Um, you know, we plant destination food sources or food sources to you know, keep the deer around to help keep them fed and all that type of stuff. They're a lot larger than, you know, some of our smaller kill kill plots or, or more strategic, you know, food plots that we use for hunting. And so, uh, you know, it all it all depends on the situation. But uh, we definitely have have uh, specific setups for specific reasons, and even sometimes for specific deer, depending on where their core area is, where they're spending a lot of time. And uh, we'll set up, spot, you know, spots specifically to try to target a deer, you know, the following season if we have enough information about them. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, you briefly mentioned it, but screening plots and stuff like that, is there a certain time of year you guys do that? And do you guys have a preference on, on uh, I'm forgetting the name of some of the screens that are out there at the moment, but um, is there a certain type you guys like to use versus others and how you do it, uh, how you use it? Yeah, we we work with a company called Boontown Seed, and they make a plot blocker that um, is, uh, I believe it's the majority of the blend is a is an Egyptian uh, forage wheat, and, uh, um, or no, it's forage, I'm sorry, forage sorghum is what it is uh, primarily, and so uh, we do not a ton of, 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 of plot blockage, I, don't, I wouldn't say, but, um, you know, we do have certain areas that we plant it to where uh, either for entry and exit, um, to offer kind of cover to get into an area, or if there we have a spot that we call the highway plot, it's kind of you know off the it's off the road not too far, and so we'd like to cover you know plant some of that for some cover. Um, and so yeah, we definitely have utilized that over the over the years, and um, sometimes we'll do the same. We'll use standing corn to the same effect. You know what I mean? If we're if we plant if we plant uh, standing corn, we'll hunt the standing corn field. We'll leave certain areas standing to where we can in, enter and exit. Um, you know, without being detected. And so that's actually something that's changed um, fairly recently in Missouri. I'd say four to five, six years ago, they changed the law to where you can manipulate a crop field. So you can come in and, and brush hog corn and hunt over it. So for Missouri, that's a state that's not a bait state. That's huge because um, we can't go and pour corn pile on the ground like can in Kansas um, or broadcast it in the field or do whatever. But you can come in, you can mow, uh, you can mow a corn field and then hunt over it. So um, that's been a, a really, really effective tactic for us um, over the past, you know, four or five years and getting deer within bow range and, and not even necessarily late season when they're really, you know, keen on the, on, the, on the corn. But even sometimes, you know, October, you get those cold fronts in October, um, you know, or even November, and you get the, you know, majority of the does kind of feed in an area and, and the first few ones to come into heat, those bucks are going to be checking that area. So, um, it's a great way that we've kind of utilized in the past uh, four or five years in Missouri to kind of capitalize on some on some big deer. Yeah, no, I, I've always thought that was a great idea, and I was surprised that um, screening with corn, so to speak, wasn't a little more popular because obviously it's it's extra food. And, uh, I mean, we, we already know that corn basically will do the same thing and kind of, if need be, you can manipulate the rows and how you want them planted. So I always thought that was... Uh, such a great idea to kind of use corn you know it's just it gives you a double whammy so to speak to do do in that manner um which is yeah. really cool and i didn't know uh i guess i did know but i didn't know the second part of that law that you guys have in missouri about now you guys can brush over corn or brush hog it and yep. over in the field so that and hunt over it which is pretty good pretty awesome yeah. because it, they've recently changed the laws of michigan same thing with they've now eliminated Kind of like you guys, it's back and forth every couple of years, but they've recently done that again. So, um, 
but which is just a good point to always be caught up on your game laws. But uh, yeah, that's pretty interesting yeah. for Missouri. I didn't know yeah. that. With as many states as we hunt, and as, as the laws changed over the like you know year to year, it's like we gotta we gotta stay on top of that stuff pretty pretty good. So, um, but yeah, the corn the corn can work as a as a as a plot screen, you know, plot blocker, and and uh, you know definitely can can work the the, the sorghum for sorghum as a you know it's a lot denser, a lot more cover, and actually usually gets quite a bit taller. So uh, it's definitely better. Uh, it doesn't break and, and fall apart as much as the as the corn does, you know, later in the year. And so uh, they, 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 each, you know, they each have their benefits. So it's just kind of a personal preference thing based on based on your setup and, and what you have going on. Yeah, absolutely. I know that there's a hundred things we could talk about, I mean, from now until September, Michael, but I, I'd love to have you back on um, again later in this, this summer and kind of talk about just catch up and see what else you guys are doing this summer. But um just want to say thanks for your time today and I know that you guys have kind of shifted a lot of content or adding a lot more content to the streaming side so before we go I just wanted to let you kind of touch on that to make sure all the listeners can kind of find you on on the streaming side of things down from YouTube and everywhere else you guys are on yeah absolutely yeah we try to um, that's one way the industry and the world has changed a lot over the past years and um, you know, uh, the, the way people are consuming content is constantly changing. And so, um, so we still, uh, we produce 13 originals for our outdoor channel. Um, so our new season, season 12 will be airing, uh, the premiering the first week of July and, uh, we'll have 13 original episodes that will air weekly, um, during the third quarter of, uh, 2019. And so those 13 episodes will repeat in Q4. Um, but then we also have a mini series that, uh, we produce called behind the draw which is basically, um, you know, abbreviated episodes of Heartland Bowhunter, different content, completely different hunts. Um, and they're typically, you know, 6 to 12 minutes long. Um, and we've, we've been releasing those on YouTube uh, as well as Amazon Prime Video. And um, and uh, we just wrapped up, we just released on Sunday our, our last episode of Full Strut, which is our digital turkey hunting mini series. So those are both available through YouTube, Amazon Prime Video, um, and then all of our library content, like our old episodes of, of the show, the past 12 seasons are all available through uh, My Outdoor TV, which is the app that, that Outdoor Channel kind of runs. And um, so all that, that stuff's available through, through that app. And then um, we have our content available on iTunes and on, uh, on, our, on our website through DVD and Digital Direct uh, download. So we really have our, our content kind of you know, everywhere and, uh, for the, you know, more day to day type stuff, social media is the way to go, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, we have updates coming out, you know, on a regular basis. So we're anywhere and everywhere we can be. And, uh, you know, if there's somewhere that we're not, that people, uh, want to see us, then please reach out, reach out and let us know. But, um, uh, right now it's just, uh, the world of content is scattered. So we try to divide and conquer. Yeah, it definitely is. And, you know, again, I'll be the first saying I, commend you guys and thank you guys pretty much for putting it on some of those outlets because just the way the world's moving I've kind of moved away from cable and man when I get to see behind the draw I really appreciate it so thank you guys for putting it out there in that manner so um, I uh, really enjoy the show and like I said every time I get to see an episode I'm like oh man that's, I'm so excited so thank you guys for doing that. Uh, it's just a great little kind of mini series and gets you super pumped and it, it's legit great Heartland bow hunter content, just like always. Yeah. Well, thanks man. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. But I definitely want to have you on again, Michael, and hopefully we can catch up later in the summer and see how the plots are going and see how you guys are battling the rain. And hopefully it doesn't go from rain to drought and, uh, wish you, you guys the best of luck the rest of the summer. Yeah. Awesome, man. Thanks. Yeah, just let me know, and I'd be happy to jump on. All right, man. Thanks again. And as you all know, we are live every Tuesday, iTunes, Unfiltered Outdoor app, podbros.com. We'll see you next week. Thanks again, Michael. Yep. Have a good one.